And so he goes into this forbidden forest when he's told not to go in there, and he comes upon a slain unicorn. And there is a dark figure leaning over that unicorn. And as Harry gets closer and closer, he sees Lord Voldemort, who's described as being uh, torn down because of all so many curses that he's projected out. And it says that every time that a wizard projects a curse out or a hex, that they grow weak and they grow different in, in their appearance. And it's described that Voldemort is now weak and something less than a man and so horrible you can't even look upon him. And so Harry walks up on Voldemort and sees that he is drinking the blood of that unicorn. He does that because he, that's is the way that he stays alive. How many know that there's life force in blood? Don't believe it? All you gotta do is slit your wrist. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have, to have a heart attack or anything else. Blood runs out. You're done. Just a medical fact. It is the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord when he died on that cross that gives us remission of sins. It is the blood that overcomes death. Vampires have known that for hundreds of years also. The people that practice vampirism, the people who practice Satanism and Druidism also have blood rituals to where they actually drink the blood of the victim. There is uh, uh, several native Indian tribes that their old customs taught them that when you kill a deer or an elk, you drink its blood and then you get the attributes of the powers of that particular animal that you just killed. It becomes a part of you. The same thing. When they drink the blood of the victim, the victim now becomes a part of them and they're drinking in their life force. So this is exactly what Voldemort's doing. Uh, at any point, Harry uh, discovers the Sorcerer's Stone. He destroys the Sorcerer's Stone after going through mazes of monsters and dragons and fluffy and all that. And he finally destroys the Sorcerer's Stone and Lord Voldemort is defeated, but he's still alive and he goes off to live to fight again and Harry survives uh, Voldemort's plans to kill him. Let's go to the second book. The second book to be released is called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And you don't have to go very far to see the occult clues on that. Harry is clearly wearing the red cape again, and that red and yellow tinted bird that he's holding on to is a mythological creature, a powerful symbol of reincarnation called the phoenix. Everybody's heard of the phoenix, the bird that went into the fire and from the ashes the new bird arises. Uh, and, and they're also now teaching that in the, uh, the New Age movement. You know, they say that the Christians are the ones that are the problems on the, uh, uh, presenting all the problems on the earth, and once we're wiped off and gone, then the new bird can arise, and it's called the phoenix. Hmm. So, look at the bird, and then you begin to look at the words written on the back of that wall, and the book describes that those words are written in blood. Throughout the Harry Potter books, not only is there the teaching of reincarnation, you will also find serpents throughout each and every one of the books. What has a serpent always been a symbol of? Satan. That's how he appeared in the Garden of Eden. Clearly, if you look at that pole, you'll see a huge snake wrapped around that pole. And the eye, you see the head, you see the eye, and then the tail is red-tipped. Harry again is wearing his red cape of invisibility and then if you look over at that torch on the left side of that wall, you'll see what looks almost like an onk. The snake, the, the serpent forming the cross part of it and then the torch forming the loop at the top. And in this book there have been a, a creature that's loose in the Chamber of Secrets and it's been turning all the students into stone. And all the, the students, even Harry's professors, seem to think that Harry might be behind it. And Harry even begins to wonder whether or not he's destined to become evil. And so Harry goes into this chamber and he fights monsters and dragons and all kinds of things. And he comes up upon a wizard, I mean, a, a, I'm sorry, a witch named Jenny who has been kept under a spell by Lord Voldemort. And she's kept that way because he's put a curse on one of her diaries. And so Harry destroys the diary. He defeats Voldemort for the second time. Voldemort tries to kill him, but Harry once again survives. Here's the third book in the series. It's called Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And the Azkaban is a prison that all the bad wizards are sent to. If you did something bad, you used your magic bad, you go to Azkaban. And Azkaban, it says, is guarded by creatures called Dementors. And listen here to what one of Harry's professors tells him why they merit fear. 
He says, he tells Harry, they breed in the darkest, filthiest places. They create decay and despair. They drain peace, hope, and happiness out of any human who comes too close to them. Even muggles feel their presence, though they can't see them. Get too near a Dementor and every good feeling, every happy memory will be sucked out of you. You'll be left with nothing but the worst experiences of your life. Now clearly to me, this is describing a demonic spirit because that's how demons work. That's what they do. They create despair. And this is one of the darkest speeches that you'll find in the Harry Potter books. Also, Harry is told that there is shape-shifting and there are killings and murders throughout this book. And once again, Harry fights Voldemort and defeats him, but he doesn't destroy him. He's not able to destroy him. And Voldemort is once again not able to destroy Harry. See, they don't want to end the book yet. And this is the fourth book. And it is the biggest book of them all. It is this book here. 734 pages worth. And it is called Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And... It is also the darkest book as of date. Now remember that she's claimed that she's already had the four books out and there are three more to go. So, looking into Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, before we look into that, I want to tell you that this book was so anticipated that Long before its release, months and months and months before its release, there were parents and children going into bookstores and they were putting in advanced orders for their copy of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Because it was anticipated that if you didn't get it then, it was going to be sold out. One Dallas bookstore, a small bookstore in Dallas, Texas, ordered 600 copies to stock in their bookstore. It is the largest order, single order, for any children's book. All 600 copies were gone in less than two hours. That's how popular this book was. And they decided, the bookstores got a wonderful idea, and they decided since the children were really going to be looking forward to this, they were going to throw Harry Potter parties all over the country. And so even news uh, uh, magazines and uh, uh, the major the news networks even started covering uh, stories about local towns covering these Harry Potter parties. And what the, the children would go and they were encouraged to dress up like their favorite Harry Potter character and the staff were also dressed up like the Harry Potter characters and they were going to have a party all night long until the book would go on the shelf the next day and they could buy it. Here's a picture of one of those parties here you see over in the right hand corner you see the two girls reading the Harry Potter book just as they got it. Uh, over in the left side at the very left top you see two boys standing there with Harry Potter glasses on complete with the lightning bolts painted on their forehead and they're displaying their copy of Harry Potter. Next to that on the uh, uh, upper right hand corner you see a poor girl who really doesn't know exactly what she is because <laughs> she's wearing a party hat and she's wearing a witch's cape, and then she's wearing the Harry Potter glasses, but they're red, not black. Poor thing. So down in the bottom, you see the kids down there, and they're dressed up, and there, there's a girl there, a, a teenage girl, she's dressed up in the witch's garb, complete with the pointed hat. Here's another picture. The one at the top are, is the staff, and they are uh, uh, interacting with the children down there. On the left-hand corner on the bottom of that is a staff person and they are holding up a mirror and this is a mirror from the book Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It is the mirror of Erised and the mirror of Erised it is said is that it is a way of divination to where you can look into this mirror and it will show you your, your heart's desire and you can also communicate with spirits through this mirror. And it is said that the spirits will communicate back to you out of this mirror. Now, in the occult, there is an actual practice of that. It's called scrying. And what they tell you to do is to sit in front of a mirror and you begin to, to concentrate on the face of that mirror. Sometimes they will take a candle and light it in front of the mirror and have, concentrate on the flame trying to see through there. And it is said that you will be able to see the past and the present and the future. And that you can also contact and communicate the spirits through that, the face of that mirror. 
So you can imagine children now being told that and going and sitting in front of mirrors trying to conjure up spirits. And brothers and sisters, if you think that letting our children dress up and represent something that God says he hates wholeheartedly is just fantasy and that it's okay, we need to examine things again. Because we are let them, we're letting them represent something that to the Lord he cannot even look upon. And yet we're letting our children do that. We're doing it to them. A lot of people encourage it. There are a lot of churches that, in, that, that encourage Halloween parties for kids to come out dressed as goblins and witches and ghosts. You know? It's not, a, it's not even okay to dress up like a Bible character. You don't celebrate Satan's holidays. But notice this young boy here, and here's the witch's hat. And he's also wearing the Harry Potter glasses. Oh, by the way, lens crafters came out with the Harry Potter glasses. And there were children flooding the stores that didn't even need glasses, but they wanted them because Harry Potter had them. Insane. Here are some of the spells that you find in the Harry Potter books. One of them is called flu powder, and this is how you transport yourself from chimney to chimney. And the way it works is this. If I want to come into your house and see what you're doing, and your fireplace is going, all I have to do is stand in front of my fireplace, I take the flu powder, I throw it into the f flames of the fire, and I turn into a spirit-type form, and I pass through that fireplace, and from that fireplace in my home, I'm able to come out in your fireplace and watch everything that you're doing without you seeing me and, communicate, and, and listen to you communicate. You know, and then I said that one night, and all of a sudden it was like the Lord quickened to me that verse about thou shalt not make his son or daughter pass through the fire. And then we wonder if what, what's going on, you know. And we called it in the occult astral projection the practice of going into a trance and letting your, your spirit form come out of your body and actually travel in a spiritual uh, uh, plane and see things that you've not seen before and hear people talking and everything else, and then you come back into your body. There are also curses. One of the curses that we find in the Harry Potter series is called the Imperious Curse. If I want to look like Stan Johnson, I'm better looking though. If I want to look like Stan Johnson, I'm pretty. <laughs> and I put a spell on me to where I not only look like him, I talk like him, I walk like him. In fact, to the point to where I could go into his home and his family would think that I was him. Imperious curse, impersonation. The other curse is called the cruciatus curse. And with this, you, you uh, inflict excruciating pain on the victim. In the occult, it's called voodoo where you take an effigy of the doll or the person that you don't like or you want to put the hex or curse on, you put a picture or something that belongs to them onto that doll. At that time, you say the right incantation, you pick up a pen and you stab it into that doll and the person's supposed to feel the pain in that same area at the same time that you stuck that pen. Now, let me say this. For anyone who thinks that practitioners of these arts have any kind of special powers or any special abilities, that is a lie, an out and out lie. It is not them doing it. The person who is the practitioner has no special abilities. What's happening is you are being kept bound by demonic spirits who are actually going out and doing these things for you, making you think that you're special. The more special you think you are, the deeper in you're going to get. Okay, that's how that works. Then we have the Avada Kedavra curse. And the Avada Kedavra curse is with a, a, a flash of green light, and it's a destruction curse. And you look at that, and it looks almost like the words Abra Kedavra that is used by all kinds of illusionists and magicians, uh, magicians and uh, what is the word? You know, like David Copperfield, those sort of things, yeah. So Abra Kedavra, but it's called the Avada Kedavra curse. And these are Latin terms. It would not be anywhere near important except that in many phases of the occult, especially in Satanism, Latin terminology is used very, very prevalently. Latin language is used very prevalently. 
In fact, at the black mass, one of the most blackest masses of all in, in Satanism, you repeat the Lord's Prayer backwards in Latin. And an interesting thing happened when Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone movie came out because the children in the movie talk Latin all the way through there, pronouncing curses and spells and things in Latin. There was a rash on a run on libraries by children, young children, trying to get a hold of books on Latin. They wanted to learn the language. What does that teach the child? That if you say the right words, you can have what you want. If you say the right words, if you do the right motions, then you too can have what you want. So it's teaching not only that, but it's teaching voice command. Alistair Crowley, that we talked about, wrote a book called Book of the Law. And look what he says. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. What that means is that you do what you want to do regardless of any consequences to anyone else. The Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey says basically the same thing. You do what you want. Then he says, one must find out for oneself and make sure beyond doubt who one is, what one is, why one is. And then he says, in the course of training, he will learn to explore the hidden mysteries of nature and to develop new senses and faculties in himself. Now that's right in line with the New Age teaching. What they say is you don't need a divine being because you are a divine being. You can be your own God. All you have to do is tap into those sources, those energies, those powers that have been laying, uh, uh, hibernating inside of you, and all you need to do is tap into those things, and when you tap into those things, you can be special. You can be part of that elite group. And so through that, children are taught not to interfere with the New Age occult transformation. In other words, they're taught that all you need to do is to tap into those special abilities, and you can become just like Harry Potter. You can become just like the, wiz the wizards and the witches in the Harry Potter book, and you can have the ability to cast spells. You can have the abilities to fly. You can have the abilities to put curses on people. In New York State, there was an elementary school that suspended 10 students. This was on the internet. And the, the article said that the students had been in a classroom where the teacher was sitting around in a circle and they were reading Harry Potter. And after they got through reading the Harry Potter for that day, they went out on the school grounds during recess and they picked up sticks and they started carving them in the, in the shape of magic wands. They went back into the school and walked up to the teachers and smacked them with the wands and started doing these Latin language curses on them. And a lot of the little, little students were saying, I'm putting a spell on you, teacher. Now you look at that and you think, well, that's not really important. Oh, yes, it is. Because they've just been taught something. Remember, what his teaching is, if they say the right words, do the right thing, they can have all these powers. And that not only that, they're able to, to administer curses and hexes on other people, able to actually cast spells. So, clearly, Harry Potter becomes Aleister Crowley's ultimate wizard child. Now, the fifth book, and I've heard different uh, sources have told me that different con uh, conflicting information. I've heard, number one, that it's to be released at the end of this month. I don't think so. I think it'll be around October or November. You see, the next Harry Potter movie, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, is scheduled to be released in November of this year, just like the first Harry Potter was in November. See, they want to keep Harry Potter alive and number one on your Christmas list. And notice the title of this particular book. It's called Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And throughout the Harry Potter books, the phoenix is a prevalent symbol. And remember that it is a powerful symbol of reincarnation. What they are teaching is reincarnation to children. This is one of the main, main subjects that they are concentrating on in the Harry Potter series. Now, what you're looking at is an artist's rendition of what they think the book cover will look like in the UK. 
I'm very curious to see what they're going to do, what kind of clues they're going to put on the book when it's released in the United States, because it definitely will not look like this. It'll be a lot more out and out occult. But it's called Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. There, she says, uh, Joanne Kathleen Rowling says that the plot is secretive, that it's, uh, it's being kept under lock and key and will not be released until the time that the book is published and put out on the market. So we have that to look forward to. And now let's look at how the Phoenix is used in the Harry Potter series. This is Harry Potter. Um, he's being told, he's talked to about the Phoenix, and he says, Fox is a Phoenix, Harry. They make highly faithful pets. His ears full of the Phoenix song, his eyes furious and fixed from Chamber of Secrets. Now let's look at what Freemason Albert Pike has to say. And if you're not familiar with who Freemason Bishop Albert Pike, Albert Pike is the man who brought Freemasonry from Scotland to the United States. He also wrote a book called Morals and Dogma of the Scottish Rite. And it is a very interesting book if you can ever get a copy of it because it is one of the most exposing books of the Freemasons. Because on page 334 it states clearly, Lucifer is God. It's right there in their writings. However, the Masons go into the, the libraries and steal them out of there because they do not want you to be able to read what they believe. That's why they don't have windows on their buildings. But let's look at Morals and Dogma, page 774, because right here, Albert Pike also tells us that there is a code or a cue to that symbol. And look what he says. All the masters of alchemy, and remember alchemy is the ancient art of trying to turn base metals to gold, who have written of the great work. What's the great work? Trying to bring in the Antichrist system. That is their goal. Has been, will be, until it happens. Have employed symbolic figurative expressions. The entire work has for its symbols the pelican and the phoenix. So now we see that even in Freemasonry, the phoenix is a very powerful symbol. He goes on to say, the dove, the raven, and the phoenix are striking symbols of good and evil, light and darkness, and the beauty resulting from the equilibrium of the two. Stop for a minute. The phoenix is a symbol of not only good, it's also a symbol of evil. So what he's saying is there's a little bit of evil in everything that's good. He also says it's a symbol of light and darkness. What's that saying? There's just a little bit of darkness and every bit of light. And that there is beauty in the mixture of that. What does that tell your child? That there is beauty in witchcraft. That not only is it fun, that there is a beauty behind it, an expression behind it. And when you practice it, you are flaunting that beauty. You are bringing that beauty forward. Morals and Dogma, page 792. Alistair Crowley writes, the ancient condition is not restored, but a new and superior condition is created, a condition only rendered possible by the process of death. And then he says, death is but through accident. Now, clearly, he doesn't believe in resurrection. He believes in reincarnation. And Joanne Kathleen Rowling symbolizes his view of death by the phoenix. That's the symbol. Remember, the bird rises from the ashes and becomes the new bird. Harry sees it turn to ashes, and then a new bird is born before his eyes. The phoenix is always, always a vital part in Harry Potter's wizard life, in his training. Now, let's go back to that cover, because remember we said that on each and one of the covers, there is a cue, or clues. Look on that cover. Harry Potter, first of all, is holding on to a goblet. That goblet is one of the more prevalent practices, tools used in Satanism and in Druidism. It is the cup from which blood is drunk from in satanic rituals when it's passed around. The victim's blood is allowed to run into that goblet and then they pass it around the room and each person drinks from that, drinking in, remember their life force and making it a part, the victim a part of them. But there's something else interesting. Look in Harry's hand and notice that he's holding one of the more powerful tools of all wizardry. Every wizard has to have one. It's called the magic wand. And it's very, 
very interesting. After you just got through seeing what is spoken of by Aleister Crowley and Bishop Albert Pike about the phoenix and about clues, look at the clues in this particular. He says, 11 is the number of magic in itself. There is magic in numbers. And Aleister Crowley is telling us that 11 is the number of magic itself. He says, 11 is the sacred number par excellence of the new eon, as it is written in the book of the law. Then he says, 11 as all their numbers who are of us. What he is telling us is that all who practice black magic, white magic, witchcraft, Satanism, anything that has to do with the occult, fall under that magical number of 11. That there is magic in numbers. This comes from magic in theory and practice. Now, look at how it's used in Harry Potter. This is Harry Potter as he discovers his wand. And by the way, Harry is told that it is not the wizard that chooses the magic wand, it is the wand who chooses the wizard. Harry is told that his wand is very special because it is one of the only wands that contain a phoenix feather. And phoenix feather is what gives it its power. Isn't it also interesting that there is only one other wand that contains a phoenix feather, and that belongs to Lord Voldemort. So let's look at where Harry finds his wand. And it says, Harry had waved what felt like every wand in the shop. At last, he had found one that suited him, this one, which was made of holly, 11 inches long, and contained a single feather from the phoenix. This is from Goblet of Fire. So here you have Harry with a magic wand made of a constructed wood called holly. So you have holly wood. Now you wonder why the motion picture industry is cranking out occult movies by the dozens. I mean, think about it. You can't even name on your fingers five movies that you've seen this year or in the last year that were totally wholesome. Most of them have overt occult significance in them. Most of them have something about communicating with spirits. Most of them are violent. Most of them show man as a lost animal, lost creature. But notice what he says, which was made of holly, 11 inches long, and contained a single feather from the phoenix. It's 11 inches long because magic, the number of magic is 11. So let's take a review. How old is Harry Potter when he finds out that he's a wizard? 11. How old do you have to be in order to join Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft? 11. And how long is exactly is his magic wand? 11. Interesting. So let's take a look at Joanne Kathleen Rowling. Now this is the author of this wonderful series. And remember that she says that she does not practice witchcraft, that she is not a witch, and she doesn't promote it, she doesn't condone it. In fact, she says that she doesn't want her kids reading anything with witchcraft in it. But she is the author. And in this particular picture, notice that she is standing and in that pose Clearly, that's a mirror behind her. And notice that the back of her head is not the reflection, the same reflection in that mirror. There's a different face. It's also interesting to note that that particular mirror is in the shape of a sun. There you see the rays coming off of the, that sun. And she is standing there holding a gargoyle statue. We've all already said the gargoyle is a symbol of a demon. And she's also giving a salute. And that salute is this. When you become a satanic witch, you are saying you are coming from the right side. And remember again, everything that is holy, everything that is of God, everything that is looked upon as being on the right hand side, you take your right hand and you say, I am crossing from the right hand path to the left hand path. And you put your hand on your shoulder like so. And clearly, clearly, this is the salute this is the pose that she is giving in this particular picture. And you wonder here, why a woman who claims that she is not a witch actually is giving witchcraft signs. However, if we look at a uh, Scholastic Inc. 
And remember that Scholastic Inc. are her publishers. They're the ones that publish all of her books and publish all of her materials. And if we look at an interview that Joanne Kathleen Rowling had with them in 1999, she seems to contradict herself because we find out that actually witchcraft was a childhood fascination. She started out having her early view of Harry Potter, and she says that it was shaped by a, a young playmate named Ian Potter, and that Ian Potter had the same kind of similarities that the, the uh, uh, book character does. And she says that together they began to role play the practices that made her books exciting and fascinating. Then they decided that what they wanted to do was they couldn't get a hold of Ian Potter, so they decided to interview his sister, Vicki, and listen what Vicki says. She states, we used to dress up as wizards and witches. Joanne was always reading to us, and, we, and would, we would make secret potions for her. She would always send us off to get twigs for the potions. So here you have a, a woman who claims that she doesn't know anything about witchcraft, but yet used to play it as a childhood fascination. And as an adult, Kathleen Rowling also majored in mythology at Exeter University in England. And you have to understand that she says that all these things in the Harry Potter series came from her vivid imagination. Well, we find out they didn't. And clearly, she's stolen a lot of things, not only from Greek mythology, but she's also stolen it from Satanism, witchcraft books, and Druidism. Here's what she says about how the Harry Potter books came about. And this was on, a, remember, a five-hour train delay between London and Manchester, England, and it also came in 1990. She says, I was sitting on the train just staring out the window at some cows. It was not the most inspiring subject when all of a sudden the idea for Harry Potter just appeared in my mind's eye. Now, where have we heard that before? The New Age Movement. The New Age Movement says that they believe that there's a third eye in the middle of your forehead and that you're able to use that to see into the psychic and the, and the uh, spiritual realm. Then she says, I can't tell you what triggered it, but I saw the idea of Harry and the wizard school very plainly. I suddenly had this basic idea of a boy who didn't know what he was. Then she tells Newsweek magazine, I had this physical reaction to it. I never felt like that before, and Harry came in this huge rush. And very bizarrely, he had this mark on his forehead, but I didn't know why at that point. It was like research. I didn't feel as if I were entirely inventing it. No kidding. She says, Harry just strolled into my head, fully formed. And then she says, the idea that there could be a child who escapes from the confines of the adult world and goes somewhere where he has power, both literally and metaphorically, really appealed to me. Writing about Harry became my safe haven. And then when asked uh, on, online for UCLON, that's the UK office uh, uh, for library and information networking, she said, ominously, Harry's going to have quite a bit to deal with as he gets older. Sorry if it gets too scary. So we have that to look forward to. Let's look at another photo of, of uh, J.K. Rowling. And in this one, you notice I put up there, I'm not a witch, because that's what she says over and over again. However, notice that she's standing in a street in England, and she's wearing a black robe. She's also giving the witch's salute, which are these two hands crossed across the chest underneath the chin. And the other interesting thing is, is this picture was sent to me by a man who reports to be a former warlock over from England, and this came out of a magazine that is made for, distributed, and published by and for witches called the Equinox. So here you have a magazine, and if you read down in the very uh, bottom there, they are praising her for her stories of a boy wizard who uses his magical powers. Now, stop for a minute. If you were a practicing witch and the real witchcraft were not being portrayed in these books, wouldn't you be in an uproar claiming that your religion was being misrepresented? Amen? However, here are real witches who are praising her for her writings. What's wrong with that picture? That wasn't enough to have the fourth book, and so they decided that they would have two others, and these are just small booklets. Notice that the first book also is, is also yellow and red in its cover, and it's called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, and then they wrote Quidditch Through the Ages, and, and Miss Rowling actually didn't write these. Somebody else wrote them and then kind of put her name on there along with, with theirs. 
but these are just like small booklets because children were clamoring so much they wanted so much more of Harry Potter they decided to come out with these books. Here's an interesting picture because this is not at a Halloween party. This is at a Harry Potter party. And notice that these are three young girls are sitting on the floor. The one in the middle is wearing black. She is the high priestess. She is also holding what's called an athame, a sword that's used in spell casting. She also has a magic wand in her hand. And it's interesting to note that they're pointing downward. The two acolytes or initiates sitting on each side of her are in purple. One has a, a crescent moon on their hat. The other one has a star. And they are giving a very, very important salute. And I'm telling you, they did not get this out of Harry Potter books. They got this out of the real thing. These girls had studied some other kind of book and got that salute from it. Because it's this. In Satanism, when you identify yourself as being a Satanist to another Satanist, it's done with the index finger and the little finger, and it's thrust out with the left hand like so. And it doesn't mean I love you or anything else. It means hail Satan. It's the sign of the horns. In witchcraft, they do the same fingers, except that the thumb comes out, like so. If you are a satanic witch, in other words, you cross from the right-hand side from, the, from working good, and now you're going to practice evil or black magic, it is done with the salute with both hands pointed downwards toward the nether realm, hell. And they are giving homage to Satan through that salute. And these are young girls. They notice they're displaying proudly their, their Harry Potter books and they're sitting in front of the pentagram and candles all around there. And then notice they've already written the Avada Kedavra curse on the wall. And these are just young girls practicing, dabbling. We have to look at what these books are teaching because if they weren't a teaching tool, are you hearing me? If they weren't a teaching tool, they would not be in the school system. We send our kids to school, our children to school, to learn. We teach them things in school. That's the whole purpose of a teacher and school, is to teach. If something is in the school system, then it is used to teach something. Harry Potter is now being read in classes. And I can't tell you uh, how many young mothers came up with tears in their eyes when I was on, on tour even before this, uh, on the last tour, and saying that their children were being required to read the Harry Potter books in class. And there are a lot of uh, Christian teachers, born-again Christian teachers that are out there now that are really on a battlefield. I mean, they're struggling because the school system is telling them to read them Harry Potter, and they're saying no because it's witchcraft. I mean, what do you do? You have to choose between your job and what's right. So we have to remember that this is a teaching tool. What are they teaching? Let's look at that. First of all, disrespect for authority. Remember that everything that Harry's uh, authority tells him, he does just the opposite. He never, never, ever carries out what is being told to him. And not only does he do that, but each time that he disrespects the authority, he's never reprimanded or punished. In fact, he's rewarded. Even Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster at Hogwarts, goes to the other instructors and tells them, if Harry breaks the rules, just overlook it. Remember, he's special. So what does that tell your child? There's no consequences for breaking the rules. In fact, they can't understand when you spank them because they feel that they should be being rewarded for what they did. Secondly, that muggles or humans without magic powers is painted as being weak and losers. So what's that make mom and dad? Muggles. Parents and their strict rules are not to be honored. In the Harry Potter series, the witches and the wizards end up becoming the good guys and the parents become the bad guys. And also that death is but the next great adventure. They're taught that death doesn't end, it just continues over and over again and you continue to be reborn. You don't have to worry about dying. You don't die and go to a heaven. You don't die and go to a hell. You stay right here and you just continue to live over and over again. That's being portrayed today. Here's one of the books, more popular books. It's called Light of Sacred Flame by Silver Ravenwolf. She is a popular witch out of the Pennsylvania area. Notice it says Practical Witchcraft for the Millennium. You see the, the woman on the cover there in the flame, and then you see the phoenix being reborn from her. What else is being taught is that there is beauty in witchcraft. Remember that what, everything that is magical is beautiful. 
the practice of astrology. Uh, there are two centaurs in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone talking together, and one says, have you not understood what the stars and the planets have told us? Things practiced and labeled as being evil in the Bible are referred to as good in Harry Potter. They are taught that there is no evil. Albus Dumbledore tells Harry, there is no evil, there is only power and those too weak to seek it. So there is no evil, nothing is evil, it's just the way that you use it. And you notice that Harry Potter has power over death. In other words, Harry almost becomes a Christ-like figure because he's told that he is special because he is the only one that ever survived one of Lord Voldemort's curses. And he continually, continually escapes death. And then they are taught that witchcraft is to be fought with witchcraft. Throughout the Harry Potter books, throughout the Lord of the Rings, throughout all the things that have magical powers in them, you will notice that if someone puts a spell on you, you put a spell on them. If someone uses magic against you, you use your magic against them. So it's witchcraft versus witchcraft. Rebellion against parental and adult authority. Remember, he rebels against everything that's taught to him, everything that's told to him by his parental authorities. And it's also teaching revenge and hatred towards enemies. Uh, at one point from Sec uh, Chamber of Secrets, page 200, Harry's talking, he says, it's not possible to live with the Dursleys and not hate them. And then Hermione, one of his friends, says, I hate that Skeeter woman. And then Ron Weasley, one of Harry's friends, is speaking. He says, I wouldn't mind knowing how Riddle got that award for special services to Hogwarts either. Could have been anything, said Ron. Maybe he murdered Myrtle. That would have done everybody a favor. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't teach us to hate our enemies. He taught us to love them. And most of all, they learn the real thing. Because here's what the Lord showed me. And I want to share that with you tonight. And it's been confirmed through other ministries that have been studying the Harry Potter series. Harry Potter, the books, the movie alone, I will agree with you, are not enough to draw a child into the practice of witchcraft or Druidism or Satanism. However, they are enough to whet the appetite for the real thing. What happens is, they, the, through the books, through the movie, their appetites become wet for, for the real thing. They want to learn how to do what Harry Potter does. And then when they go to mom and dad and ask mom and dad if they have any powers and they say no, and they go to the school teacher and they say, well, do you know about how I can do this? And they say no. They, use the one, they go to the one tool that's available to every child on the face of the earth now, the wonderful system of the internet. And if you go on the internet and type in spells, hexes, and curses, you will come up with 85,000 hits alone. That's not including satanic websites. That's not including witch websites like the Witch's Voice. That's not including all the other occult websites, just spells and hexes and curses alone. And those sites are maintained and run by actual practitioners who are ready, willing, and able to teach your child how to do the real thing. That's how they're inducting our children. Now, when asked how Miss Rowling felt about fundamentalist Christians questioning her books and saying that there might be something a little more than just fantasy in them, do you want to hear what she had to say? Now, you don't want to hear. Okay. When asked in an interview for CBC for Kids how she felt about fundamentalist Christians questioning her books, she replied, I think they need psychiatric help. She says, I say honestly, can they read some of them? Talking about the books. I think the Potter books are moral. By large, the Potter characters go with their conscience, which is a powerful thing. There you go. So, as she's saying, there you go. And if you think that something is wrong or this is not fantasy and you think that something is wrong with the movie or the books, you need to go and make an emergency uh, appointment with your psychiatrist. She also states in an interview posted on www.amazon.com, she says, I decided on the school subjects very early on. Most of the spells are invented, but some of them have a basis in what people used to believe worked. 
We owe a lot of our scientific knowledge to alchemists. Now what she is saying is that in the books there are spells that are invented, but there are also some spells in there that work, that are the real thing. Let's look at some of the things that uh, you will find of the occult in the Harry Potter books. One of the first things we find is ghosts. Now, the Bible specifically says that it's appointed once for man to die, and after that, what? Judgment. Not keep coming back and roaming around this world and watching what everybody else is doing, listening to everybody else's conversation. Doesn't happen. And we are told that we are not to even try to communicate with spirits of the dead because it says the dead know nothing. So, in Hogwarts, there are four fraternities. The first fraternity is called Gryffindor, and that's the fraternity for the, the good wizards and the witches. And then there is Slytherin, and that is for the bad witches and wizards, and their symbol, by the way, is a serpent. And then there is the gray area, gray witchcraft fraternities, and those are called Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. And each one of those residences have ghosts in there, and they communicate back and forth with the students. The next thing we'll see is divination. Throughout the books, there's always divination, some kind of fortune telling. Whether they use crystal balls, whether they use uh, scrying, looking in the mirrors and conjuring up spirits, things like that. Again, this is an abomination unto the Lord. Then we've talked about the magic wand. It's made of Hollywood, 11 inches long, and it contains a single phoenix feather, and that's what gives it its power. There's spirit communication throughout the books. Uh, throughout the Harry Potter series, uh, Harry's dead father, the spirit of de Harry's dead father, constantly communicates to him and tells him secrets that he needs to know. Then there's mind reading. When you go to Hogwarts, every student goes through a ritual called the sorting hat. And the sorting hat is a crumpled witch's hat that's an actual living thing. And what they do is they sit the, the uh, student in a chair, they take this hat and place it on top of their head. This sorting hat reads their mind. And from the thoughts that they have, it determines which fraternity that student needs to go to. And at one point, they set the hat on top of Harry's head, and it almost puts him in Slytherin, because it reads that he is, his thoughts show that he has the potential to become evil. Then there's always the casting of spells and curses throughout it, and they're not easily reversed. Here's uh, one of the more popular designs for the teenager. This is Teen Witch by Silver Ravenwolf. And you'll notice that on the front cover there, the girls are all wearing occult symbols. Uh, the one in the black top and the, and the blue dress is wearing the yin and yang. And by the way, I don't know if you know in, in Chinese culture, but everything is backwards in Chinese culture. They get married in black and they get buried in white. And that's also a symbol of reincarnation. And that black stands for good and the white stands for evil. And you notice that the other girl is wearing a red top next to her and she has the pentagram on it and then the girl over to the far left is wearing a red dress also with the crescent moon and the stars and then here's this poor guy standing there in the middle looking duh with his hands in his pockets what that is for is telling you that witchcraft is for females and that males are very rarely accepted and if you like the book now you can get the kit and this is something new on the market it's called Teen Witch Kit. There again, you see the boy, you see the girl, you see the crescent moons and stars in the middle. Over to the far right, you'll see uh, right next to the girl, there is a spiral, and that is the Celtic symbol for male fertility power, complete with the lightning bolt in the center. Down from that is that, that rope or that cord is called a binding cord. What happens is you take the, a photo or a, a something that belongs to the boy that you want to put a spell on so that you can get him away from his girlfriend or that you can get him to love you and you bind the, that cord around the picture or around whatever it is that you've got of his and you say the right words and then it binds that boy to you. Then over in the uh, far left you see a, a symbol that has a moon and then on each side of that are crescent moons. And I walked into our local Barnes and Noble there in Topeka before we left on tour and there were four of these kits right along with the book. And about a week before we left, walked back in there to look for something else, and all those kits were gone. This is how popular that is. And then you look on that kit, and around that kit, there's that gold trim. And on that gold trim is writing. And when Stan and I were doing the, the uh, in his office, 
we were getting ready to do the PowerPoint for the presentation, he looked on there, and I couldn't decipher it. And he looked on there and he says, that's Hebrew. And I said, well, what in the world would Hebrew be doing on a witchcraft kit? Well, where did witchcraft originate? Some of the other things you see, Harry Potter, black magic blood rituals. I told you before that this is the darkest book of all, the Goblet of Fire. Let me tell you why. Hang with me here. In this particular book, it starts out with a killing. It starts out with a murder. Uh, one of the townspeople have gotten into Lord Voldemort's home, and he's beginning to listen to them plot on how they're going to destroy Harry. At that point, when he thinks he's hidden out of sight, a 12-foot serpent comes out of nowhere and scares him into the room. He's confronted by Voldemort. He wants to confront Voldemort, and he tells Voldemort that he's going to tell the police what they're plotting. And then he confronts Voldemort and says, turn yourself around, let me see you as you really are. And so that says that the, the, one of his men take the chair, the wheelchair, and turn it around so that he can see him. And it says it almost dies of fright by what he looks like. At that point, he says, I am not a, a man, Muggle. I am much more than a man. And with that, he takes a wand and he kills that particular person, kills Frank Bryce, the man who, who got into the home, with a curse. And it's the Avada Kedavra curse that we talked about earlier. At that point, Harry can feel that there is a murder at the same time that it occurs because the lightning bolt scar in the middle of his forehead starts to hurt and he can't figure out why. Harry goes through some other things, but the really, really important thing is what happens toward the end of this book. Remember, this is 734 pages. They get through that first murder and then they get through all the other things, the exciting things that happened to Harry in the middle part now listen what happens toward the end. Toward the end, Harry enters into a Triwizard Tournament. And in this tournament, the Ministry of Magic has placed a participating age of 17 years. In other words, you have to be 17 years of age in order to participate in this tournament because they feel that anyone under 17 could be killed. They're too, you're too young to participate. Someone illegally enters Harry's name into the Goblet of Fire. And that's where the names are drawn from to participate in this tournament. Harry knows that his name has been illegally entered. Does he do anything about it? Does he say anything? No. Albus Dumbledore, when the name is drawn, hears Harry's name drawn. Harry's only 14 now. He's not, no longer to the point to where he can uh, uh, participate in any tournaments like this. He's too young. And he hears, Albus Dumbledore hears Harry's name spoken when it's drawn from the Goblet of Fire. Does he speak up? No. So Harry has been illegally entered in and he enters into this tournament by cheating. Harry then gets into this tournament and it's perilous. One of the tasks that's designed to do is it says that you have to go into the, to a lair and that you have to steal an egg from a dragon. And Harry chooses the fourth dragon. And he goes up against the dragon and he steals the egg. The next task that he has to do is you have to dive into the lake just outside of Hogwarts, and you have, to, you have to rescue a person that's being kept under the water there by people called merpeople. Then you have to go through mazes, and those mazes are filled with riddles and monsters and dragons and things like that. And then you come to the last task of all, and that's getting the Triwizard Tournament Cup. And what happens there becomes the darkest part yet. Here's what happens. At the same time, Cedric Diggory, and that's one of the, the participants from another one of the witchcraft schools, and Harry reach the Triwizard Cup at the same time. They decide to share in the glory. They talk about it, and the, and the, the prize is a thousand gold coins. They both grab on to the cup at the same time. What happens then is that they are mysteriously transported to a graveyard. Light starts splashing around them, green light. It's the Avada Kedavra curse. One of the green lights hit Cedric Diggory and kills him dead. The next thing happens is that Harry's been knocked off his feet. He's unconscious. When he wakes up, he's tied to a tombstone. That tombstone reads Tom Riddle. That's Lord Voldemort's father. And he hears a voice, bone of my father, bone of my bone. I chant to thee, I summon thee. 
And then from out of nowhere, one of Lord Voldemort's men starts coming out of the corner and he's dragging a man-sized cauldron. He then goes and takes the withered body of Lord Voldemort and puts it into the cauldron. The next step he does as Harry watches is he pulls a dagger out. He takes his wrist and he slices off his wrist. He lets the blood run into the cauldron and mix with the body of Lord Voldemort. The next thing, he walks over to Harry. Harry's screaming. He walks over to Harry, picks up Harry's wrist, and he cuts it at a strategic location to let blood run out. He then mixes Harry's blood along with the blood that he just caught, got from his own self, and he mixes that with the cauldron and with Lord Voldemort's withered body. The cauldron begins to glow white. And from that cauldron arises Lord Voldemort, more horrible, more powerful, more evil than ever. Brothers and sisters, what just took place is what we call in Satanism and Druidism a satanic blood ritual. And that's right there in the book. And my question is this. If this is fantasy and it's only a book, why is she putting actual rituals that have to do with Satanism, Druidism in those books? Those are actual rituals. And if yet, if you ask a child about those things, a lot of time they won't even remember that particular part. There's also sexual magic. It's talked about uh, the witches and the wizards going off in the bushes together. There's black magic, there's white magic, and there's also demonic possession, spirit possession. Because at one point, Lord Voldemort is so weak, he has to live. He can't, uh, he's, he's killed all the unicorns, and he can't drink their blood anymore. So he has to survive by possessing the body of someone else. Professor Quirrell is one of Harry's professors. And he, profess he possesses the body of that professor. And in the movie, when you look at Professor Quirrell, you look at him from the face on, it's Professor Quirrell. But if he turns around, it's Lord Voldemort. He's living in the very back of the body of, Lord Vol uh, of, of uh, Professor Quirrell in order to survive. So now you have demon possession. Can you see now where all the abominations that were spoken of in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 9 have now been placed in the Harry Potter books? Each and every single one of them. And I believe it's books like this. Here's to write a silver broomstick, and you see the, the female appeal. Here's to stir a magic cauldron. There, these are all by Silver Ravenwolf, a witch's guide to casting and conjuring. And if you're not sure whether a muggle or not, you can even get this Muggle's Guide to Magic. It's a, it says down at the bottom, it says, Fully Illustrated Guide to Understanding the Harry Potter Books, as if you really wanted to know. Here's a Sorcerer's Companion, and this book actually tells you it's a guide to the magical world of Harry Potter. And this book actually shows you where the mythological creatures came from and the folklore behind them. And I believe it's books like that that are leading our children toward books like this. And this is the Satanic Bible by Anton Zandor LaVey. This is the Bible that I studied from and taught from seven and a half years being a Satanist high priest. Here's another book if you want to be a Satanic witch. It's the Satanic Witch by Anton Zandor LaVey. Now, Let's look at what our wonderful Christian leadership is telling us about Harry Potter. Because you would think that they should be on guard and on watch for us. Let's see. Let's first of all look at Christianity Today. It's a popular Christian magazine. And the author of this is Ted Olson. He's one of the editors of that magazine. And look what he says. As far as I can tell, no major Christian leader has come out to condemn J.K. Rowling's series. Many have given it a thumbs up. Even those Christians known for criticizing all that is popular culture have been pretty positive about Potter. So they're saying that Potter is okay. Now let's go to a popular Christian columnist named Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson has a popular radio program called Breakpoint. On one of his break points, he was talking about the Harry Potter series. Let's examine what he says. It may relieve you to know that the magic in these books is purely mechanical as opposed to occultic. That is, Harry and his friends cast spells, read crystal balls, and turn themselves into animals, but they don't make contact with the supernatural world. Where in the world is he getting that from? 
I have to say, some of these men need to spend more time in the Word of God and less time in Harry Potter. <laughs> he also goes on to say, these books also feature wizards and witches and magical potions, but in addition, they inspire the imagination within a Christian framework and prepare the hearts of the readers for the real life story of Christ. Oh, oh, I see, I see, because Harry Potter is almost Christ-like. He survives death, he can overcome death. That's got to be it. Uh, some other things, let's look at focus on the family. James Dobson. James Dobson has...